it is 10 a.m. in New York, 4 p.m. in Johannesburg, and 9 p.m. in Bangkok. Welcome to In Transit with Sunday Bean. I'm an intercultural strategist, transformation facilitator, and solution-oriented coach. And I am on a mission to help you adapt and succeed through any life transition. If I'm being honest, loneliness, social isolation, and polarization are three of the most painful things I've experienced. And who hasn't experienced some or all of that since 2020? Questions I have are, how do we cope? What can we do to reduce the sting of these experiences or even prevent them? And I think the answer is much more simple than you'd expect. And it's connected to intergenerational relationships. Our special guest today, Rabbi Chaim Herring, offers answers in his book, Connecting Generations. Rabbi Chaim Herring, thank you for being here on In Transit. Thank you. Good morning. So um, I want to share more about the book, uh, but first let me acknowledge uh, your own place of being in transit right now. You have so kindly <laughs> agreed to be um, together today, even though you are recovering from surgery. So I thank you for your impromptu um, ability to find a space in your home where you can be comfortable um, in this process. So thank you for your flexibility today. Well, th th thank you for allow allowing me to to be a guest, first of all, and to be a guest from my bedroom, which has become my study, my dining room, because the surgery wasn't planned before our home remodel was. But I have a sense of humor. There's some irony in this, I guess, and maybe <laughs> metaphor. Right? right. I feel like the the remodeling of, 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 of my home mm -hmm. to adapt to COVID is mm -hmm. sending me a message about the interior remodeling that I have to do. So apologies for the background, but hey, that's life today. And we just have to learn to um, not just to, to accept it, but to embrace it. Absolutely. And for those of you who are also watching the video version of this, you can see my mother from the 60s in the background at some beauty pageant <laughs> option. So we are both in transit in some in some way. So thank you for being here. Um, I want to share a little bit about your book for those who have not yet read Connecting Generations. That's actually how I came across your work. Um, Connecting Generations identifies and analyzes these phenomena I was talking about before, loneliness, social isolation, and polarization. You probably wouldn't expect that when you pick up a book called Connecting Generations, but it is offers so much more than analysis of what's happening, like a precursor to what we need to look out for. It also supports us in becoming more empathetic uh, for ourselves and others and offers direction on how we can shape um, more mindfully, uh, a vibrant reality, um, as you say in the book, for ourselves, for immediate communities, and for society at large. So what you're doing um, is big. I'm going to give the listeners also a little background on who you are and, and what you bring to this conversation. Um, Rabbi Chaim Herring is um, a PhD and CEO of HaimHerring.com and coaches nonprofit leaders in entrepreneurship anticipatory leadership and intergenerational relationships. His mission is to is preparing today's leaders for tomorrow's organizations. Wow, that's what we need right now since everything is shifting. He's also served as a congressional rabbi for Beth L. Synagogue in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is an assistant director of the Minneapolis Jewish Federation and the founding director of Star Synagogues Transformation and Renewal. There's many more things in addition to his <laughs> scholarly work, popular articles. Um, but what I'm most excited about as well is your forthcoming work um, calling um, Generation to Generation in a Digital Age. So how did you get here, uh, Chaim? Tell us a little bit more about what led you to this <laughs> point where you're talking about intergenerational relationships, isolation, connection, and all of it. Um, as a very young rabbi starting out in a congregation in 1985 in Minneapolis, after being in school for many, many years, no one had ever prepared me for the fact that mm -hmm. in the morning I might be working with preschool children. In the afternoon, I might be working 
um, with retired people, men, women, maybe in a book club, mm -hmm. afternoon teaching high school kids, and in the evening out again at, at a meeting, um, typically with, with leaders. Mm -hmm. I, I learned quickly that one size fits all in how mm -hmm. to approach people um, was a recipe for failure. And I found a book, I think it was one of the first on generations called Generations at Work. Turns out that it was written by someone in Minneapolis who um, mm. passed away to, at a young age. And, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm spiraling back now mm. and have time now to devote to a topic that's really been dear to my heart. And that's why, um, you know, it, it's one can never predict how an interest that starts off early will mm -hmm. blossom um, later. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's beautiful. So you and I were speaking before about how we're facing all of these challenges um, due to COVID, due to history, context, identity, all of these things that are happening, um, not just in the U.S. where you're located, but globally. Um, can you say a little bit more about why what we were saying that intergenerational relationships are what I believe a old solution for new problems. Um, can you say more about what you've noticed about the benefits of being in community across generations? Sure. Um, I, I have, I, I generally agree that we have an old solution um, to a new problem. But I think we also have to adapt that old solution. And what I mean is, before people talked about the, the sandwich generation, I think it was a sociologist by the name of Dorothy Miller who coined that term back in 1981, early 80s. Back then, the sandwich generation, and I, I checked this out, I think an average um, slice of sandwich bread is something like four, four to six inches square. Right. The sandwich <laughs> metaphor is there's a slice on top, a slice on the bottom, something in the middle. The person in the middle was typically a woman who mm -hmm. was raising children, taking care of elderly parents or in-laws, um, trying to maintain a job. You know, so you had the caretaking of the children on the bottom and the caretaking of the elders on the top. Today, I think, depending upon where you live, it's more like a hoagie or submarine mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And it's a foot long. Mm -hmm. And we have not six, but seven generations now. Wow. So it can't really be a sandwich. And, and the other thing that's different is that it used to be that only one generation typically felt certain pressures. You know, it might be retirement, might be health. But now everybody is vulnerable. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be the, the boomer parent who's out of work or the Gen Xer who is mm -hmm. being challenged by a millennial and mm -hmm. may lose a job right now or the economy the way it mm -hmm. is. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe it's a younger person who is actually enjoying work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're all, we, that's why we need each other. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all mm -hmm. have to think about not to continue the food metaphor, but being Jewish um, food is a big <laughs> part of community. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like we have to to feed each other. The, there's mm -hmm. a, a wonderful story about the difference between heaven and hell. Um, mm. In hell, everyone is sitting in front of a sumptuous banquet, mm. right? but their elbows are locked. Mm. In heaven, mm -hmm. it's the same thing, but the difference is that people feed each other mm. across the mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so wonderful when you make those connections. Um, it's good for mm -hmm. the soul. It's good for wisdom. It's good for life. Liter I mean, literally, mm -hmm. it's it, it's yes. life prolonging. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 we become excited by learning new things, by meeting new people. And America, I believe, is the most age segregated society in the Western world. So we we've got a problem. It's awful. Yeah. And combine that with the level of ageism that is recorded. It, it makes it far more complicated. Right. Um, all right. So this is, yeah. this is big. With, through your work that you've done in the past and are working on, what are some of the myths 
that you are hoping to debunk in the world? And if that language doesn't resonate, what are the messages that you're hoping to help communicate that aren't yet in our consciousness? Okay, so let, let, that's a, uh, a great question, by the way. Um, so let's talk about the myth part first. I want to use boomers, even though they're on their way out, finally. Um, I'm one of them, so I can say that. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we do have to make room, you know. I mean, um, <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about the case of, of boomers and millennials as a kind of mini case study. Right? Mm -hmm. Because as you point out in your podcast, right, the the contexts will change, the mm -hmm. the label generational labels will change. But the reality of having four or five generations in the workplace mm -hmm. with mutual stereotyping will mm -hmm. not change. Right. right. So um, as a part of my research, and it was really hard as a boomer to to not respond to the millennials, but I had my research hat on. So I asked millennials, um, when you hear the word boomer, mm -hmm. what do you think of? What, what comes to mind? Mm -hmm. um, so for millennials, they perceive boomers, first of all, what's wrong with their bucket list? Why can't they have fun while they work? And mm. why do they think that they're entitled this was millennials calling boomers entitled, mm -hmm. meaning by dint of their age or seniority, they just assume they'll be in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. um, all they care about is work. They're obsessed with work. They don't know how to have fun. Um, they they don't want to relinquish anything. And then when I ask boomers their perception of millennials, they use words like snowflake, which is really demeaning. Um, mm -hmm. They What they talked about was you know, they want to kick the bucket. They want to have fun now. I mean, that's mm -hmm, not the mm -hmm. way we used to do it. Um, they're pleasure seekers. They can't commit. You know, they're indecisive. They're insecure. And it, so what I what I took away from this is that no one has a monopoly on stereotyping. Mm -hmm, and each mm -hmm. generation stereotypes the other. So that's the the, the myth part. I want to just talk about the stereotypes for a second, because you know this and, and I know this from sure. the research, but maybe our, our listeners don't. What I've learned in this process is that those stereotypes um, are, I want to say, exaggerations or even fabrications when we look at the data, right, that people attribute it to that other group, but it might be based of phase of life, or it might be actually just not true. And, and, and something exploded into our consciousness because it was a, you know, clickbaity title from media. And this I think is really important because as an interculturalist, when we have a stereotype and we engage with someone and we're looking for that affirmation. We're actually looking for evidence that it's true. We we do not see the full person and we might also see something that isn't even there. And I think that's dangerous. Um, it's dangerous for our relationships. Um, it's also dangerous, I think, for our sense of self because then we might also believe the stereotypes about what they say about our generation and sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It just is so limiting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you followed up with that, that question. So when I interviewed millennials and, you know, my, my children are, are millennials. I didn't interview them, um, but <laughs> I've gotten to know them quite well over the mm -hmm. years and their mm -hmm. friends, you know, they have really, they have really big hearts. They're not all about mm -hmm. pleasure. I interviewed mm -hmm. millennials who were volunteering for the Special Olympics, who were on a crisis hotline, um, mm -hmm. who were like a big brother or big sister, who were giving back to their communities, like totally out of line with the right. stereotype of pleasure seekers. Yeah. And then, of course, I interviewed boomers who, you know, just relish having, you know, someone to mentor, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. not to control, but really to mentor genuinely, to share experience, skills, to share power, to share mm -hmm. authority, um, mm -hmm. to provide emotional support because mm -hmm. our millennial children um, are, I would say, somewhat more fragile. Their sense of self is not as secure. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, the stereotypes are so damaging because you can dislike or even hate a stereotype. But in that real meeting, it's more likely that you're going to wind up really connecting with them. Mm -hmm. And that's where the phrase perennial for me is so important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't coin the term. I'm using it differently than the person who did. So I have a, a black thumb. I could actually make an artificial plant die. Um, <laughs> and it takes a lot of skill. I think we're, I think we're soulmates. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't help it. I grew up in Philly. I lived in New York, you know, it, it's terrible. The only time I used the shovel was at the cemetery. It's a terrible thing to say, but, <laughs> but oh my God. Uh, some friends of mine, <laughs> some friends oh. of mine in, um, you know, good friends are gardeners. Mm. And one day a friend of mine was talking about his perennials and describing how you know, it's the same root system, but every year, you know, the flowers die off. Um, they form seeds for the next iteration. They're nourished from the same root system, but they look different. But you could also mm -hmm. see similarities. And I, I, I was stopped in my tracks. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that is the human task, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. really to relinquish that which has restrained mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, to retain that mm -hmm. which is still helpful, and then to make sure that we're planting seeds for renewal that still has some continuity with the past. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter what age you are. Mm -hmm. You may not have the awareness, depending upon your human development stage, that mm -hmm. that's what you're a part of. Mm -hmm. But that's something that I think by making, um, by articulating explicitly right? We can be reminded, oh, we, we each have mm -hmm. a role in this. We, we have mm -hmm. a, a stake in one another's success. That's so beautiful because when I hear that, I also hear that growth. It's in our design. If we're doing it in a way that is <clears throat> intended, so to speak. Um, and it made me think of a quote that I came nice. across um, when I was um, preparing for this interview. It's from Fred Small. And um, the, he talks about the perhaps the greatest justice issue of all is intergenerational theft. They say the eighth commandment says thou shall not steal, but every day we uh -huh. live unsustainably, we steal from our children and their children. So this yeah. idea of like our, we are stewards of our oh. lives, of our community, but also of generations that follow us. I don't, I don't know how often I hold that awareness in my own planning, in my own goals, right? But it is, like you said, it's embedded in who we are as a humanity, right? I, I'm not I'm not sure that I held this awareness, you know, mm -hmm. and, until maybe I reached age 50, which was extremely liberating mm. um, because I, I really felt like I was at a point where, of course, I wanted to be sensitive and, and empathetic to people, but it became very important to be more of what I believe in mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what I value. So yep. maybe it's the responsibility of those who are at this stage mm -hmm. um, to make more explicit what it mm -hmm. is that we share. And, you know, it, it never goes down well to lecture people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like for people right. who are older to lecture people who are right. younger. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's in the shared work that we can do, right? Mm -hmm. That we can model those kinds of, of conversations. And I, I, I don't, I still don't garden, um, but I, I love the idea of community gardens, mm -hmm. both for mm -hmm. the metaphor and mm -hmm. also for the opportunity to get to know people of, right. of different generations. Those kinds of activities are very fruitful, I think, right. for restoring those connections. Yep, I think that is a beautiful um, comparison. And I, I always talk about this idea of you can't hate who you love. Like we can't <laughs> demonize or stereotype people that we actually care about. And it's hard to not care about someone when you are in community with them and creating something beautiful together. Um, and that's bigger than uh, the crossing of age 
boundaries, right? We're talking about ethnic boundaries, racial boundaries, you know, political boundaries. I think there's a lot that could be learned from that. So the other question that I started mm -hmm. talking about was like, what do you wish was in our consciousness? When you, when you think about your book, your, your Connecting Generations book and the one that's coming, what are some core messages you hope that people hold on to? Sure. Um, one of them is one of your ongoing themes in your work, and that is empowerment. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't take an act of Congress for somebody to reach out to another person in their community, mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. neighbor, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. To reach out to an organization, right? That either offers mentoring opportunities or other kinds of volunteer opportunities where you get to interact with people of different generations. Um, it doesn't take some sort of legal authority. And I know this is risky today, but when you're standing in line, this one of the millennials that I, whom I interviewed suggested this. You know, she said, when I'm standing in line uh, at a grocery store, um, sometimes I'll just strike up a conversation with someone. And if I see someone older, especially, I'll say, boy, I, I really like the coat that you're wearing. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's mm -hmm. just sort of, multiplying these these little kinds of acts on the structural level right why is it that we we segregate ourselves in terms of yeah. housing right? right for i mean i hate the idea of a retirement community first of all i don't like the word retirement mm -hmm. because for mm -hmm. me it's more like renaissance right mm -hmm. I, I like mm -hmm. if somebody somebody asked me are you retired i'm going to say no i'm renaissance um, because now <laughs> I'm going to use that one. I'm going to use that one, but I think you have to start Please. gardening. If you're going to be a Renaissance man, you have to start gardening. I think. Okay. Well, we, we have a few plants on our deck. So like, um, you know, I got to start, start small. Um, <laughs> but because, you know, it, it is an opportunity to, to flower in, in, mm -hmm. in new ways mm -hmm. at this stage. But I, I, you know, I really think that housing is such a big issue right mm -hmm. there are you know apartments for people generally who are let's say millennials or just starting mm -hmm. out um there are neighborhoods where you know mm -hmm. the people are too similar yes, and absolutely. i think that 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 you know it's just it is so unhealthy mm -hmm. we used mm -hmm. to have neighborhoods right where um, there were intergenerational connections. They were organic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that um, when a community center is built, uh, a, a design of intergenerational should be interwoven. Um, yeah. In some countries, they, they place pre preschools and kindergartens um, next to people who are in old age facilities. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. like a town square. And mm -hmm. um, that way the the older people are energized and who doesn't love to hear the voice of young children right, right. and at right. the same time younger kids don't fear or mm -hmm. think that older people are without value right. so there are lots of things that can happen on the structural level but mm -hmm. if we wait until the structural level is solved mm -hmm. it right. may be too late so what it, what action steps can we take Here's a question I like to ask, part of the perennial challenge. Do you have at least one friend who is a generation up and a generation down? Right. Right. Make I would that ask your people, goal in the, right, in the next If they look months. at their 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 WhatsApp or their, you know, their social media, who are they messaging? Are they people from different generations? I did this um eight week intergenerational learning experience with women from twenty mm. to seventy-five last year. This is our year anniversary when we're recording this. It blew my mind. I I thought I was going to go in there um, looking for themes like my qualitative researcher, the 20s say this, the 30s say that. That was not true at all. <laughs> there was maybe only one theme where I found an age-related theme, but the other themes were ran through like red threads, uh, painfully true. Uh, because of some of the challenges that women uh, face, right, as um, minority identity, right, and then add that to other minority identities that were there globally. 
Um, but what I realized <laughs> is I bring so many assumptions to my relationships and how I hold myself in relation to others. So for example, I felt nervous when I was connecting the, with the younger women, like they're not going to think I'm cool, right? Like, or relevant. <laughs> and I, I caught myself um, feeling uncomfortable and it was, it was limiting how I wanted to engage with them. I also caught myself um, alert with, because I was asking explicitly about intergenerational relationships. I learned what I have done in the past is I'll take, more of a mentor role, like an auntie role when they haven't invited me to. Right. So if they're right. younger, I automatically think basically, I'm basically saying, don't make the mistakes I made. <laughs> right. But I haven't been invited, you know, wait for an invitation or, or ask if they're open to that. But what if we just connect uh, as individuals? And I've learned so much from the younger women because they've gone through much harder life experiences vastly different um, life journeys. So I have so much to learn. Well, and, and that's why I think being a learner, being curious, mm -hmm. right? um, casting aside assumptions, it, it's not possible to cast all aside, but I think if, and, and I don't know how one develops um, sort of a posture of, of curiosity, but for me, it, it comes from my faith. And that is um, every every person has his or her hour, his or her moment. Um, if if you're open, and you believe that all people are given the same dignity, equality, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, freedom, then of course I can learn something from everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have to mm -hmm. be willing to pay attention. Right, right. I also think we need to pay attention to what's happening in ourselves. So we were at um, a restaurant and there was a woman celebrating probably her 80th, 85th birthday and all of her friends were surrounding her. And I noticed um, the dialogue in my head and I noticed the chatter with the people I was with. It wasn't a default of dignity. It was, oh, that's so cute, right? Infantilizing, uh -huh. right? Elderly or... Yeah. or um, little shamey around like old fashioned clothing or hairstyles, like watch what's happening within ourselves. And I caught myself in that moment, like wanting to go there and be playful. And I thought, no, that's not dignity. Like, how can I be here in this moment, watch this celebration and honor their dignity. And when I walked out, I touched the, you know, I looked down at the woman and I said, look at this amazing community you've created you know, look at who is here to support you today. And yeah. I wouldn't have seen that had I let myself go into the old default, which mirrors all of the stereotypes that we have about people who are older. You know, you're reminding me of um, one of the triggers that led me to write this book. So um, I, I, I have a bunch of cool old friends. Um, one of them is my rabbi who's 94. Um, mm. And the other one is a hundred three year old. Uh, I'm sorry, turned 104. Wow. Yeah. And every week, um, you know, when they're in town, and if not, we either do it, you know, by Skype or FaceTime, depending upon what they each like. Pretty cool at 94 mm -hmm. and 104, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we we study the um, our our weekly Torah portion. When we were together, now I'm I'm the youngest in the group at you know 63. <laughs> the the ninety the ninety four year old to the hundred turned to the hundred four year old at one point and said, "Hey Harold, compared to you, I'm just a kid." <laughs> so there there is if you're open, mm -hmm. so much learning and mm -hmm. wisdom and experience. And they said to me at one point um, early on in the research pro or when I was thinking about you know what I wanted to write on next. They said, you know, I, I don't want to lead anything anymore. I don't mm -hmm. need to lead anything. Mm -hmm. I feel that I have something to offer. Younger people are polite, but mm -hmm. other than saying, hello, how are you? I have no organic way of mm -hmm. connecting with them. And I yep. love being with younger people. And these are people of caring families, by the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they, mm -hmm. they, they miss the interaction. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I, 
I remember too many times. I also have the ability to make my smartwatch look dumb. Um, you know, I can be a, I can be a little a little slow of finger. Um, and I know sometimes that when younger people look at me, mm-hmm. I, I kind of see a thought bubble like, what does he possibly know? You know, he mm-hmm. can't, I mean, mm-hmm. doesn't know technology all that well. He's trying. I, I give him right. credit for that. Mm-hmm. But I have mm-hmm. nothing to learn from him. So where's mm-hmm. the shared work that we can right. do? Where right. age doesn't matter and it's really who's mm-hmm. got the, the, the best experience for the task mm-hmm. at hand. Right. Totally. There's so much untapped potential. And I mean, you said something about how do we develop a posture of curiosity? Um, I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful question to ask ourselves, right? How do we, how do we tap into that um, ourselves? I, I also feel like there's, um, it can come when we're put together in safe contexts right? One of the things as an interculturalist, we talk about contact right. theory and this idea of if you put people together, they will learn, but that's not true. It has to be like a shared power right. dynamic, equality, common goal, right? So where, how can we get ourselves into spaces where that is possible? Mm. Um, and, and I think that is one, one way that the curiosity will emerge when you're in those safe spaces of shared power, shared goal, then naturally, I think that curiosity will, will come up, or at least I hope, I hope it will come up. Um, well, I, I think yeah. another question that, that we might ask mm-hmm. ourselves is, what did it feel like? Think of a time when we were dismissed by someone, where mm-hmm. we weren't taken mm-hmm. seriously. Mm-hmm. And what did that feel like? And how mm-hmm. might it feel like for the person you know, at home, in my community, in my workplace. I mean, it's really, it's both simple and complex. But I think it, Mm -hmm. you know, it it all starts with the self because we can't, we don't have the luxury of waiting, right, for Mm -hmm. somebody Mm -hmm. else to do it for us. We can Mm -hmm. be empowered, as you call upon Mm -hmm. us to be, right? Like, Mm -hmm. what's stopping us? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe mm-hmm. we can't change mm-hmm. the whole world. We can change a part of it. Right. We don't have to wait okay. until tomorrow. We could start today. If every one of the, your your listeners would, you know, I, I don't want to say like hug a person of a different generation because, you know, that would be problematic. But metaphorically, <laughs> reach out to mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Who, who's been really hurting right now? Who's alone? Or whom mm-hmm. do you want to learn from? Who do you want to say thank you to? Mm-hmm. Right? Who taught Absolutely. you something? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And this idea, when you talked about if you've been dismissed, that is something when you connect it to ageism, applies to all generations. I worked for a consulting firm during and outside of college right away. And um, I was the youngest in the team, but I was leading the team uh, of my mm-hmm. incoming interns because I had the most experience and it was an awkward dynamic to navigate. And my my boss was a wonderful coach and she supported me in saying, yes, you're the youngest, but you have the one who's been in the project the longest, right? So it's easy to be dismissed on the younger end of the scale. We know in midlife, it's easy to be dismissed, right? And then of course, um, in later years. So I love that question. I think everybody can feel that burning pain of when you have been dismissed. But like, you know, boomers who said, don't trust anyone over 30. And now it's like, <clears throat> don't trust anyone under 60. I see that mm-hmm. happening a, a little bit with Gen Xers mm-hmm. who are sort mm-hmm. of moving into that stage of life where, you know, uh, parents are getting a little older. They might have their mm-hmm. first, you know, sort of health events. They might be thinking of moving to a different location or a different country. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they've got still older child, uh, child, Mm-hmm. child raising responsibilities and it's it's like no you know we we just have to continue to try to remain in mm-hmm. open posture and it's so hard right now mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. um we used to give people the benefit of the doubt and now mm-hmm. it's like judgment detriment into the doubt you know of course you're out mm-hmm. to harm me so mm-hmm. it's just so toxic right now that yeah. the the challenge is more urgent Right. Absolutely. So can you say more about your forthcoming book? Uh, and your first book, 
said so much. Why this next book? Why now? <laughs> so um, connecting generations was really a journey for me out of my out of my um, accustomed self. Um, mm. The book that I had written, co-authored before, was with a Protestant colleague of mine, a Lutheran colleague, and I thought back then, like, I need to get out of my Jewish bubble. Like, there's a world mm. out there, and it's it smells like it's starting to burn a little. Um, mm. That was seven, eight years ago. And then after that, the next logical step was sort of out of the faith-based world into the general community with connecting mm -hmm. generations. Um, and now I, you know, I, I think it's really fascinating for me that I can do both and I can write for mm -hmm. the general community. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for this book, I'm writing for a more particular community, the Jewish community, although, again, it's a case study, but because mm -hmm. we're all mm -hmm. part of the human tribe, you know, there may be yeah. some idiosyncrasies, um, so it's called Ledor Vador in a Digital Age from Generation to Generation mm -hmm. in a Digital Age. Mm -hmm. And I surveyed over um, 650 boomers, Gen Xers, um, millennials, a few Gen Zers. The, the largest mm -hmm. cohort, of course, was um, boomers. We had a good representation of Gen Xers and millennials. And mm -hmm. I asked questions about... Um, Let's look at on the community level, the share, potential shared action level. Right? Mm -hmm. I asked um, each of all generations about pressing social issues like mm -hmm. um, health care, guaranteed health care, um, mm -hmm. immigrant reform, um, LGBTIQ discrimination, um, mm -hmm. sexual violence and harassment in the workplace, um, mm -hmm. climate change. And mm -hmm. there was remarkable agreement that mm. across the board that everybody should be working on these issues. These should be a priority for mm. the Jewish community to engage with these broader issues in mm -hmm. our community. Mm -hmm. So, so much for the myth of people, you know, of different mm -hmm. generations, right. not caring about mm -hmm. these controversial issues across the board. And in fact, the, highest percentage of caring and importance registered across these six or seven issues that I just mentioned mm -hmm. right now. So that to me sounds like a potential area that is ripe mm -hmm. for um, yeah. intergenerational work. Yeah, absolutely. But we need a space for that. We need a way. Um, you know, I created this uh, experience and it was a call for people to join me because there wasn't a space to slot into. Do you know of right. spaces that people can currently slot into or maybe to create those spaces? Um, uh, well, th there are a few. Um, I, I think that, and I, I've really looked far and wide and haven't been able to find many, but potentially I think that congregations, which are designed inherently to be intergenerational, um, now they're multi-generational, most of them. Mm -hmm. They're not intergenerational. And just as you said before, yes. just because you have people together a different age, it doesn't make mm -hmm. it intergenerational. You know, it right. could just make it uncomfortable right. if you don't have the right sort of facilitation yeah. and setting. <laughs> exactly. But theoretically... <clears throat> right. I mean, I'm sure you mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that very well. Mm -hmm. But I think that congregations are one place where it's possible. I think that community centers, um, mm -hmm. non-sectarian community centers um, are mm -hmm. possible places. You know, I think that before the pandemic, um, the idea behind Starbucks was to be that third place. Um, mm -hmm. And that is not work, not family. Mm -hmm but the place yeah. where people could come together, maybe get to know one another. It was modeled after the, I think the pub in the, in the UK, like that was a place where people of different backgrounds came together, socialized. Um, I, I think that recreating um, these third places, you know, kind of post COVID or with COVID management um, is something that we need to think about. Unfortunately, when I look at the coffee houses around me, most of them have shrunk their footprint for the seating part and enlarge their footprint for the drive-through 
pick up part. Right. Um, right. Totally. So it's, mm -hmm. um, I, I'll point out one other example that I remember that I did during my research. So in Cleveland, um, there was the Cleveland, I think it was the Cleveland Conservatory of Music. Um, next to it was a very, very, um, it was a, a kind of elegant retirement home. And somebody of, on the board of this, this retirement home had the brilliant idea of opening up a couple of apartments for these music students mm. and having them live there. Mm -hmm. But in return, uh, they had to practice publicly and they also had to offer a number of concerts during the year. Beautiful. And it was just so stunning, you know, to see, you know, like strangers of different generations where, you know, someone who was older and retired became like the mate, uh, the, the maid of honor at a younger person's <laughs> wedding that they connected with where young and old in the communal <clears throat> kitchen, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Shared mm -hmm. recipes. Yeah. And a lot of the people had retired, you know, they loved music. They had been involved in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what did it take? It took a board member mm -hmm. and a CEO um, who I think said when he heard, first heard the idea, he thought he was going to be not only in charge of this housing um, development for those who were retired, but also like a resident advisor for college students at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, <clears throat> but with the right kind of, you know, criteria, I, no, it, it really worked out. Why, why yep. can't we do more of that? Totally. I have my vision is, you know, we talked about multi-generational means many generations present and intergenerational is where you actually have connection and communication that goes from my background with intercultural communication. It's not, hey, here's how the Japanese do it or here's how they do it there. It's about what happens <laughs> when we come together. Right. And my challenge is in the corporate context, our corporations are inherently multi-generational but are definitely not intergenerational in terms of um, safety, um, authenticity, connection, right? There's so much hierarchy that goes into it and there's a power dynamic that goes into that space. And my vision is how can we encourage corporations to take their multi-generational organizations and help them be in or intergenerational because then we've got um, mentorship that goes up and down at the age levels, right? We're creating trust in new ways. We're engaging in new ways. My hope is that when you have that experience, um, it will then bleed out into your community life where you're like, oh, that was really cool. You know, I did a pop-up intergenerational thing at work. And now I know it's great to have relationships across generations. I want to do that in my community. So I, I, I hope I hope that that you'll be successful because I, I think about the loss of of wisdom, intergenerational mm -hmm. wisdom, right? Because yes. there isn't that reciprocal kind of mentoring. But I, I know uh, you know in some smaller companies, for example, mm -hmm. owners have experimented with rethinking what what are benefits like because the benefits that mm -hmm. somebody needs who is in their fifties probably mm -hmm. different from the benefits that somebody who may be paying off their student loans needs, right. you know, so right. is having a one size fits, fits all benefit package. Is that really right. a way to respect the, you know, the generational needs? Um, I know that there are other companies where they might, you know, sort of bring people together from different generations and have each of them perform tasks that are uncomfortable for them. They're, they're, they're mm -hmm. out of their accustomed range of what they do, but they are in the range of what another, somebody in another generation does. And then sort of kind of process like, what, what is that like? Um, yep. it, it is a challenge to move bureaucracies, but sometimes in the nonprofit world, at least I've been able to, to, to ask people, let's run a beta, right? Mm -hmm. Much, yep. much less threatening. Right. To say yes. it's a beta. OK, yes. if it fails, it mm -hmm. fails and we're going to learn something anyway. Um, right. But to run a beta. Right. With clear mm -hmm. communications, goals. I mean, I, I sort of my my mantra is um, think big, move fast, start small, assess, mm -hmm. communicate, um, evaluate and then either close it up or close it down mm -hmm. or scale it up and take the learning mm -hmm. and then apply it to the next one. I mean, will larger corporations be willing and maybe COVID has given us that perspective and maybe the confidence, mm -hmm. right?
that mm -hmm. we're much more adaptable than we thought, right? Um, right. Will larger exactly. corporations be willing to engage in more betas because they've gotten pretty good at it? What right. do you think? Right. I, I hope so. I hope so. And I think engagement is the word that is relevant. Like, how do I keep people engaged? Um, <clears throat> when people are disengaging or at a distance. I also think connected to this polarized world that we live in, um, connecting over generations is a safer place to start because our defenses aren't yeah. as high um, compared to other identities that we hold. And from an intercultural perspective, if we are able to create a safe place to start um, and then we start to see the humanity and create a relationship we're more open to um, expand the way we see someone on the areas that would be more polarized. One way to make movement in a very, very challenging context. So again, I'm remembering when my co-author and I started working on <clears throat> um, this book, this new book, COVID hadn't hit yet. Mm, right, and then we right. thought during COVID, oh my gosh, COVID is is kind of an, an accelerator for mm -hmm. trends that are out there, digital yeah. trends that are out there, yes. social trends that are out there, both positive and negative. Then we had, um, and I, I live in Minneapolis, the, the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which was just so ugly, you know, just so morally bankrupt and wrong that led to the mm -hmm. protests. So then we had the social protests coming with COVID. Mm -hmm. Then we had the political polarization. And I mm -hmm. thought back mm -hmm. and, and ask, well, first of all, I asked my, my father who's 93 and my mom who's 90, do you ever remember a time in your mm -hmm. life when society was so um, fragmented and divided and angry? And they said, no, we don't. It never happened mm -hmm. before. Historically, mm -hmm. I realized that in the 60s, we had the social justice protests, right? 70s were Watergate and 80s mm -hmm. were uh, the beginning of HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. So we had like some space in between both the social justice protests mm -hmm. and the political issues that we had upheaval. And then um, not a pandemic, but certainly a big, mm -hmm. a big fear about mm -hmm. how AIDS was was decimating first the gay community and then people realized, oh, it's not God's punishment. Of course it's not God's punishment. That's right. nonsense, you know? Mm -hmm. And here we have a trifecta of mm -hmm. all three mm -hmm. forces coming together, right? We've got COVID, we've got political polarization like we've never seen mm -hmm. before. And then mm -hmm. of course we also have you know, uh, tragically, the, the, the social justice protests couldn't be more relevant. So we've never experienced this trifecta of forces before. And they they are nonstop. They are unsettling. Um, you know, tomorrow is not like today. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you adapt to a world like that? But here's one thing that I took a lot of comfort in. When I watched the protests across the country after George Floyd was murdered and saw people of color and white people, I saw young people, I saw old people mm -hmm. and everybody in between, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like there is so much power in shared intergenerational work mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. are we going to remember what, you know, that we can be effective, more effective together? Mm -hmm. um, and I mm -hmm. really think that the mm -hmm. onus is on some way people who are older because we have the ability, we've got the perspective, we've got the history, you know, social justice is something that we started um, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. We abandon it. We're coming back to it now. Um, we have mm -hmm. to let people who are younger lead and we have to mm -hmm. also lead from the side, which means mm -hmm. respect it doesn't mean that automatic, mm -hmm. like, oh, I have so much to mm -hmm. teach you because mm -hmm. if we did, you wouldn't be having this, you know, again, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it also means like mm -hmm. we can take some risks. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. It's true. And that's, I want to end on hope. Like I want to um, focus on what is possible. And I think it goes back to how we started. 
the answer is really right in front of our faces of just looking at ways that we can connect across the generations, ripping down our own stereotypes and assumptions first um, so that those connections will be richer, right? And then asking what is possible based on where we're at, right? Absolutely. Um, These uh, intergenerational barriers are artificial. We erected mm -hmm. them. So to mm -hmm. your point about hope and empowerment, if we yeah. put, put them up, I, we can take them down. Yes. And that absolutely. to me is empowering. I, you know, I like, it's really annoying, I guess, to, to live with an optimist. Um, <laughs> that's what my family tells me sometimes. Yes, <laughs> yes. But why not? I mean, we have, right. okay, we can't control everything, but we have more mm -hmm. influence than we're willing to accept because it's scary because then we have to mm -hmm. do something with it. Yeah, that's right. My, okay, family always criti <laughs> my family criticizes me. They say, mom, you're always so positive. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, I'll take it. I'll take it. I hear you. Um, <laughs> I hear you. Right. So, <laughs> so um, let's focus on you for a second. I mean, you're, you see so much with the work that you do. Um, you also live your own life, right? Um, so do you mind if we shift on you for a second and look at where you're at, right? We have ATTs, Ambitious Transformation in Transition. Um, which transitions are you feeling right now? Sure. So professionally, I would say I'm on version 5.012 or whatever the number mm -hmm. would be. And I'm really enjoying focusing on writing, researching, um, meeting people. You know, I'd like to do more in person. Um, I think on in about two weeks from now, my co-author and I are holding two intergenerational, uh, structured intergenerational conversations. It'll be on Zoom, oh. hopefully one day in person, where instead of just mm -hmm. talking about bringing generations um, together, mm -hmm. we're modeling that in our research yep. to have them talk about right. shared things. So I love that that aspect of my life right now. I'm a lot less happy with some health transitions that I'm going through. This is not a great time. I, the boot is, you know, temporary. I, you know, it didn't stop me mm -hmm. from putting my foot in my mouth. So that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, but getting uh, being diagnosed with autoimmune conditions during COVID was not a very cool thing. Um, mm. So, you know, trying to figure mm. out how to manage my health because the, you know, mm -hmm. this pandemic will be manageable. But when you think about it, there's been like Zika, HIV, SARS, you know, avian mm. flu, mm -hmm. um, COVID. So this is part of the global world that we're in today. Mm -hmm. So managing um, health issues uh, and it was so hard for me before the vaccine came out I mm -hmm. I felt like a like a hermit and mm -hmm. I you know the research on isolation and what it does to someone's mental health I mm -hmm. felt very deeply mm -hmm. and I never mm -hmm. want to go through that again and I never want to forget what that felt like because as we were talking about earlier, a lot of people were isolated before COVID for various reasons, yeah. and we yeah. have to we have to remember them. So those yeah. are the the transitions, and you know I love being a, a grandfather. Um, mm. And oh, Sunday you're supposed to say, "Oh my gosh, you look way too young to be a grandfather." Come on, I'll wait. <laughs> that would that would no that would be ages. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say congratulations. So that, that's kind of a, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I've been one for over over six years mm -hmm. now, but like that's really, mm -hmm. it is so much fun and such a delight. And you want to talk mm -hmm. about learning and listening and mm -hmm. just being. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that those are some of the, the transitions. That's so beautiful. And when we think about your own transformation, are you, do you feel a pull more towards something internal or is it the external, all of it, or even a goal, like a performance led transformation that you're feeling right now? No, I, I think most of my um, pulls have been internal. When I, when I first started yeah. out as a congregational rabbi, you know, there were rules and structures and 
expectations. I mean, one really funny story. I, it's funny now is when my daughter was born, you know, I started wearing pink shirts and pink and purple ties and a congregant came up and said, what size is your neck? And I said, why? He said, well, just tell me. I said, I told him. He came back with a white shirt and handed it to me a week later and said, you really shouldn't wear pink publicly. It's not befitting. <laughs> so, of course, I bought more pink. <laughs> that was my response. <laughs> but it was, it was a I little constraining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a little constraining. And by the time mm -hmm. I got to my um, second iteration, um, where we were like a startup unit within a nonprofit, like I felt, mm -hmm. wow, this is really so much fun. I need to learn more about this. And that's when I went back to school and mm -hmm. got a PhD in organization and management. And progressively, you know, what matters now is what is significant to me? What do I enjoy? What yep. people do I enjoy working with? Yep. I don't want to work yeah. with people, you know, who are mm -hmm. negative. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it's right. like, I, I don't want to be a, po a Pollyanna, but mm -hmm. you know, where, where's the gratitude? What, what can you be grateful for when you wake up every day? So right. all of this is internal. It's what do mm -hmm. I feel is most significant and also mm -hmm. feels joyful to me. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that we have that in common. It's I use my podcast selfishly to talk about things that are meaningful to me <laughs> and and uh, yeah. joyful for me. Um, and I hope that it you know, brings joy and meaning for other people. Well, I, I so enjoyed listening to your podcast. I, in fact, I thought, OK, I'll listen to one or two and I, I couldn't stop. So, <laughs> you know, that 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 the, the laughter, the joy, the the significance of meaning. I mean, it's it, you're a great model, and I just want to make sure mm -hmm. I have a chance to to thank you and to say that publicly. Thank you. That means so much to me, especially from someone that I respect so much. So that does mean a lot. Um, so tell me, you know, with all that you've already done and where you're at in your life right now, what? How do you define ambitious for you? So ambitious for me will be um, is a few things. One, while I'm working on this book furiously now with my co-author, um, I've outlined another book that's much more serious on um, mm. what happens when someone who is a, a caretaker for a family member who's chronically ill suddenly is in need of medical help because, mm. you know, in this case, it's I became uh, chronically mm -hmm. ill, you know, so yeah. that that inside outside perspective. And I also mm -hmm. started to collect some anecdotes. Um, my life has been really funny. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I'm one of the funniest people I know. I, there's a, a, a decreasing number of people who agree with me. But, but funny <laughs> things have happened to me along the way. Um, <laughs> and I I, I want to write them down. It's, it's just for, for mm -hmm. me and my family. And yeah. like, I want to try to chronologically remember my life through, um, mm -hmm. through humor, which to Beautiful. me is, is sparks creativity. Mm -hmm. So that, that's ambitious. That's Outlining I two books it. I'm working on, on another. <laughs> I did not expect that. That's wonderful. While you're dealing with all those other things. That's so wonderful. Oh my gosh. My, my face hurts from smiling right now. Um, and I always think that's a good sign. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna. I'm one of those people who does think you're authentically I, funny. So you can you can add plus one to your list of people who think you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's and so I, I just want to make clear to your audience, I have not paid you to say that. Okay, that was that was authentically coming from Sunday. <laughs> no bribes involved. There were, um, there were no this, pay, pay you know. exchanges. <laughs> You did. You're going to slip me some money to say that you don't look like a grandfather. No, I think that's going to happen later. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, is, um, obviously. So much fun. So fun. Um, people need to have more of you. So if they want more of you, your work and your humor, where can they find you? Um, LinkedIn, 
is really mm -hmm. the place where I'm most active. You know, I've got a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I'm a very inactive Pinterest page because that's like, I'm learning, I'm getting there. Um, yeah. But I would say LinkedIn is really a good place to find me for more content. You can go to my website at kayamherring.com, H-A-Y-I-M-H-E-R-R-I-N-G.com. Um, and those are the best two places. Perfect. Wonderful. I'll make sure that's all in the show notes. Um, this has just been lovely. And I, I want you. to just sort of recap some things that I'm taking away. Um, I think it is this duality of the easy and the hard that we hold, right? It's actually really easy what we have next to improve our quality of lives, to um, curb loneliness and isolation. But I understand the hard in there that we need to sort of deconstruct some of our own stereotypes, uh, maybe take risks and reach out to people in new ways, right? So um, that's what I'm holding both of those. And I hope that someone, you know, if this resonates with them when they're listening, they'll, um, just take that next step, right. in holding both. So thank you for being here. This has been wonderful. And thank you to all of you who are listening. This is in transit with Sunday bean. Wanted to thank you again. Oh, you're so sweet. I, I just wanted to say thank you. Definitely didn't feel like work it was just, and work, work and fun can live harmoniously together. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thank you. So I will leave you with the words of Brene Brown. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, there is suffering. Um. <laughs>